glad you're here today uh, worshiping with us at Unity Christian Church. We're continuing in our uh, series on the Ten Commandments. We're on number nine, uh, and we're going to be talking about that uh, uh, in just a few minutes. Before we do, why don't you stand, and uh, Jason and the team are going to come and lead us in, uh, in our singing and worship today. Good morning, everyone. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thy For the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thy glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy glory. Revive us again. Glory and praise to the God of all grace Who has brought us and sought us and guided our ways Revive us, revive us again Fill each heart with thy love May each soul be rekindled with fire from above Hallelujah, thy the glory Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Before you spoke it to be, you were the King of Kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave. 
be breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Back in 1991, two guys wrote a book, uh, The Day America Told the Truth. Guys by the name of Peter Kim and James Patterson. And, and the premise is what they did was they just did sent out a survey across the country. And uh, they were anonymous. You could answer these questions any way you wanted to answer them because no one would ever know what your answers were. And they compiled it all into this book, The Day America Told the Truth. Without any fear of uh, recrimination or consequences, uh, America did tell the truth. And over the course of their research, when all these surveys came back in, uh, the opening introduction to the book uh, lists what they called 23 revelations about America and truth. And one of those reads, lying has become an integral part of the American culture, a trait of the American character. We lie and we don't even think about it. And sometimes we lie for no reason. Along that same line, the New York Times did a, their own survey and they discovered in their survey that 91% of the people that took the survey say they regularly, they regularly don't tell the truth. <laughs> they regularly don't tell the truth. 20% admitted that they couldn't get through a day without a conscious, premeditated white lie. <laughs> yeah, sure, I, I lie about every day. I can't get through a day without telling a lie. That was their conclusion. Doug uh, Mushro wrote an article entitled 19 Great American Lies. Uh, 19 Great American Lies. Uh, let me just give you a few of those great American lies. Number one, top of the list, the check is in the mail. <laughs> great American lie. Number two, we service what we sell. <laughs> uh, give me your number and the doctor will call you right back. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, you know. Here's one that, you know, probably should be at the top of the list, you know, because I've never found this to be actually true. It really is a great American lie. One size fits all. <laughs> you hat down over your ear thinking, well, wait a minute. Well, it kind of fits. I guess kind of counts. Uh, uh, here's one you really got to watch out for, okay? Great American lie. I just need a few minutes of your time. Because <laughs> it never is just a few minutes, is it? Huh? No. Uh, 
uh, uh, you know, this one, this one is ongoing. You've encountered it, I'm sure. We'll have your table ready in a minute. <laughs> 40 minutes later, we'll have your table ready in a minute. Okay, all right. That's what you said 40 minutes ago. Okay. And here's one. I'm from the federal government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> Great American life. That's why, as I said last week, these Ten Commandments are as contemporary and as relevant today, maybe even more so to a, to a certain extent, as tomorrow's news cycle. Uh, and today's commandment probably has become even more relevant in our culture and our world today. The Ninth Commandment says, You shall not give false testimony against your name, na- neighbor. And here's the thing, when, when this was uh, applied more readily, because sometimes we say, well, I don't lie. You know, I don't lie. Um, but, we, you know, I just don't always tell the truth. <laughs> See, that's false testimony. If you want to kind of draw the line in the sand and say, well, I'm not lying to you. I just haven't told you the whole truth. That's, you're still lying. So the idea of false testimony is far more, has has a broader scope than we like to think because we think, I don't lie, I don't lie. Well, maybe you do. (laughs) Maybe you're lying about lying. (laughs) Uh, But I get carried away. Uh, It was used, part of this was part of of the judicial system of Israel. It became, you don't bear false witness because in, in, in the justice system, uh, it only took two witnesses. It, you know, there were, there were witnesses. Even to the time of Jesus' trial, there were only a couple of witnesses, you know, that said, hey, this is what he did, this is what he said. And as a result, because there were two witnesses to what he did, that was true. Uh, and there are several instances throughout the Old Testament where two witnesses, sometimes they were acknowledged they were false, not the witnesses, but they were acknowledged to be false witnesses. But as long as there were two, people were condemned to die as a result of the testimony of those witnesses. So, and the highest, the the highest level of truth-telling in a court of law, this idea was you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And we've kind of narrowed the focus down sometimes. It says you shall not lie. That's an injustice to the text when that's all it says. Because we may not always tell a lie, but we may not always tell the truth or we tell a lie in a different way now the bible says god hates liars it really does say that matter of fact proverbs 6 16 and 19 there are six things the lord hates seven that are detestable to him i love that little parenthetical phrase there seven that are detestable to him by the way and one of them is a lying tongue and look at this a false witness who pours out lies god hates that And so, in order to, this came later, but the idea was this is a violation of the ninth commandment. Which leads me to the question, why do we lie? Because, you know, this is probably one of those commandments that, you know, uh, we've all violated (laughs) in one form or another. Because sometimes we lie to impress people. you know, we, over and over throughout the news cycle for years, decades even, where people have falsified their credentials or their resume, uh, you know, uh, uh, college professors, coaches, uh, uh, employees uh, have falsified their, have lied about their application or their credentials or their background in order to get a job, so it, to impress and ultimately lie on the application in order to maybe advance their position. Uh, we lie about past accomplishments uh, to win a claim. You know, I, I, oh yeah, I did this, I did this, I got this, I got that. Uh, I have all my diplomas. I'm not bragging, uh, but I have all my diplomas on the wall in my office. And Judah uh, came by the other day, or I guess it was last Sunday, and he's standing there and he's looking and he goes, why do you have all your awards on the wall? <laughs> and and uh, I said, Oh, I said, let me tell you about those. These are where all I went to school and I, all my diplomas and my ordination certificate. <laughs> I, I want to prove people that I, you know, I am educated. I'm not trying to impress. I'm just trying to <laughs> declare facts. <laughs> I'm not as dumb as you think I am. <laughs> yeah, you know, anyway, we, but people will lie about their past accomplishments, you know, uh, uh, in order to you know, think more highly of them. Sometimes we lie to get revenge. 
um, sometimes we lie to make a profit. We talked about this last week. We lie so we can steal. <laughs> Take, check two off your list because there we got that covered, you know. Uh, sometimes we lie for out of convenience. You know, uh, we just don't have the courage to say no. Uh, so we'll make something up. Um, you know, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ouch, that maybe hurt a little bit, you know. Tell them I'm busy, you know. You're just watching TV. Tell them I'm busy, you know. We don't have the courage to say no, so we lie. Sometimes we lie to escape punishment. I- I've told you about the time I tried to, you know, con a, a Coke out of, uh, out of the grocery store where mom shopped. Uh, uh, I went and told the guy I lost a dime in the, a dime in the machine. Um, and I was just a little guy, so I'm not as old as you think, getting a Coke for a dime. <laughs> anyway, and it, you know, I told you the story. I won't go into all the detail. But when my mom asked me where I got it, I said, where would you get the money to buy that? I, and Sydney, my friend from school, was standing next to me. I said, Sydney gave it to me. And he goes, I did not. <laughs> so I lied and I stole. You know, Sometimes we, we lie just to escape punishment. And turns out I lied, I stole, and I still got punished. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work, folks, okay? Like the kid who was supposed to be home at midnight. The curfew was midnight, and, uh, and, he, and he blew the curfew, and he sneaks into the house, and he's trying to sneak upstairs, and he hits that third step always. That third step squeaked real loud, and his dad yelled uh, from, from his bedroom, Is that you, son? Uh, yeah, it's me, Dad. Uh, and then he hears the voice, What time is it? And, and before he could answer, the clock on the wall cuckooed twice cuckoo cuckoo and the son said it was a moment of my most ingenious moment I stood there on that third step and I cuckooed 10 more times cuckoo 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 (laughs) we lie in a lot of different ways for a lot of different reasons and Paul says this in Ephesians 4 25 therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor now we know this for a fact. We live in a culture and a society today that minimizes the seriousness of lying. We just kind of shrug it off anymore. Uh, sometimes we get to the point where we know we can't believe somebody, so we just shrug it off and go on, well, they're just lying. You know, it's, just, it's all a lie. And we've been conditioned that way to accept lying in our world and in our culture. And that's why it's so hard to break the pattern of lying because we've just become so used to it. Not that we, may do, not that we do it. But others do, and we just say, well, you know, that that can't be true. That's not true. And we may understand the why. Well, I know I've lied to escape punishment. I've lied this. I I know, uh, you know. We we understand the why sometimes. Um, What we don't understand that encompasses this particular command are the ways we lie. So I'm going to give you five ways we lie, but we wouldn't necessarily call it lying, okay? Okay. False, it's false testimony. It's not just about, you know, where, I've, where I know I've lied, I, I've told a lie, I know I've lied, you know, so what, you know? This is other ways that we lie that fall under the category of this particular ninth command. You shall not give false testimony. First of all, uh, exaggeration. Exaggeration. This is just the idea of exaggerating or embellishing an incident or a story just to make it interesting. And the person that's constantly exaggerating and embellishing, uh, this person really doesn't need to be believed. They just want to be listened to. So they just keep heaping on detail after detail, whatever it might be, you know, and none of it to be true. Uh, We think in order to get people to listen, we need to exaggerate something and twist it around a little bit because it sounds better. It, It makes it better. But when we exaggerate, we lose integrity And and credibility. So don't exaggerate. It is a a form of giving false testimony. Um, And here's the thing. If if you're telling something and uh, you you think it has to be exaggerated or embellished, it's probably not worth telling or listening to uh, without that. So, okay? So exaggeration. Number two is distortion. Distortion. It's the real subtle way of lying. Uh, when we distort something 
uh, we're not necessarily uttering bold-faced lies that we know can be identified as lies. We simply twist the truth a little bit for our own purposes. Misquoting, uh, so-and-so said this. Well, they may not have said that exactly, you know. But I can distort a little and it'll sound better and maybe even make it more believable. So we kind of distort it. We take words out of context. Well, yes, I did say that. And this is a big one today. And, you know, uh, so-and-so said this. Well, I said that, but in the context, that's not what you got is not what I said. Any other form, any form of distortion uh, is nothing more than subtle lies. Uh, the third way we lie is through gossip. Somebody once defined gossip as hearing something you like about somebody else you don't like. <laughs> hearing something you like about somebody else you don't like. Uh, Proverbs 26. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. And boy, sometimes do we love to eat gossip because it is so good. Tell me more. Um, uh, like the three preachers that were out and decided they all had the same day off. They got in a boat and they went out on a boat. They're out there fishing and said, look, we're out here. It's, you know, there's nobody within miles. I think it would be a good idea that we all shared our deep, dark secret of what our worst sin is, where we're wrestling with sin. And they all three agreed, and the first one said, I, I, I have problems with greed. Uh, I, I love money. I can't get enough money. I, I don't believe I make enough money, so I've been known to dip my hand into the offering box from time to time and, uh, so I can have some spending money for the week. The second one, you know, said, uh, well, if we're being honest here, I've got a problem with lust. I just can't seem to overcome it. I can't seem to control it. And, I, you know, so pray for me about that. And the third one pipes up and says, my greatest temptation and greatest sin is gossip, and I can't wait to get out of this boat. <laughs> we gossip through false sympathy. And why that, by any of that, you know, because we'll say, you know, whether anybody knows it, whether anybody knows what's going on, we'll say something along the false sympathy. Isn't it just so sad to hear about so-and-so? Oh, I haven't heard. Oh, you see, it opens the door. False sympathy is one of the ways we gossip. We gossip, sometimes we open the door to gossip by asking questions. Uh, have you heard about so-and-so? Have you heard about this? What seems to be going on there? And so we ask questions, and it opens the door to gossip. And then there's what I call Christian gossip. And that's gossiping through prayer requests. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I, I think we need to pray for so-and-so because they really are having a hard time. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for somebody because they're having a hard time. But if you know they're having a hard time... Uh, you know, I like, I like what's happening uh, in, in social media and, and even churches, you know, where they'll say, hey, somebody will come up to me and they'll say, I, need, I, need, I have an unspoken prayer request. Uh, God knows it. I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing it with you, but I have friends who are, uh, and would you just pray for my friends? And you see that a lot anymore on, in social media. Hey, could you pray for so-and-so? It's an, or, or not even so-and-so. I have a friend who has an unspoken prayer request. You know, that's always good. But it used to be, you know, well, you know, I hear they're having trouble. Or I, I hear, you know, they've got this going on or they've got that going on. So would you please, so Christian gossip, it's be a prayer request that share a little too much information and opens the door to gossip. Because, see, gossip is only an unsophisticated way of lying. A fourth way we gossip is through slander. Now, slander is really giving false testimony, uh, false ac accusations that tend to impugn and damage someone else's character. James wrote, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Do not give the, make those false accusations. Do not impugn other people's character. Do not discredit them. That's what he's talking about. Don't try to make up stories that hurt people. Don't exaggerate, embellish in order to slander. 
Don't, don't exaggerate or distort in order to slander. That's what he's saying. And sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> this is a good one. Sometimes we don't even have to make up stories at all or, or distort or embellish or, or any of those. Exaggerate. Gossip, we don't have to do any of that, you know, because, you know, sometimes if something's going on, uh, we don't even have to say anything at all. And when the question comes up, we say things, well, I, I can't talk about that. You don't have to. You just did. <laughs> I, I can't say anything about that. You don't have to. You just open the door for false testimony. You've already put that person in doubt in the people that you are talking with. Proverbs 10.10 says, He who winks maliciously causes grief, and a chattering fool comes to ruin. Um, A fifth way is flattery. Insincere compliments. Insincere praise. Um, The flatterer really doesn't mean anything they're saying. They're lying. Um, Proverbs 26, A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Proverbs 26, insincere talk that hides what you really are thinking is like a fine glaze on a cheap clay pot. You know, I, uh, Antique Roadshow, they'll bring something in, you know, this belonged to my great-great-great-grandmother, and I'd say, well, you know, that's pretty good because it was just made six years ago. <laughs> I, you know, somebody may have told you that, but that's not that, necessarily that's true. That's, that's what flattery is all about. That fine glazed cheap pot, you know, it's not true. They're lying. Sounds good, and maybe we like to hear it, but honestly, the flatterer's words are cheap. They're lying. So there's ways we lie. And, and as, as I said, the idea of giving false testimony covers those a whole lot more than just lying because we know when we lie. You know, that's the easy part of it. But this commandment covers a whole spectrum of giving false testimony so what are we to do what does this commandment tell us the positive side is tell the truth tell the truth and first of all tell the truth completely you know we've said it ah well okay I told the truth I just didn't tell all the truth well we're to tell the truth completely Proverbs 10 10 says someone who holds back the truth causes trouble so how do I get over that? How do I get around it? You don't get around it. You've got to go through it. And the way you get through it is to tell the truth completely. Because it causes trouble. That's what the Bible says. What kind of trouble? Well, it'll cause resentment if you're not telling the truth completely. It'll eventually cause mistrust. People won't trust you if you're not telling the complete truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The wisest guy of all time. Solomon says you're going to get into trouble by not saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Tell the truth completely. We have to be brutally honest with people sometimes. We agree that honesty is the best policy. Even if we have to be brutally honest. And I'm going to cover the other side of that in just a moment. Proverbs 28. In the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. Number two, not just tell it completely, but tell the truth consistently. Tell the truth consistently. Let me tell you something. Being honest 80% of the time, you don't get any points for that. Being honest 80% of the time, you know, uh, eventually people are going to (laughs) wonder whether you're in the 20% mode. (laughs) Whether you're telling the truth. Are you you in that 20% mode right now? Because I don't know if I can trust you. Telling the truth 80% of the time doesn't count. Tell the truth consistently. I I heard about a guy one time who lied so much, he had to get somebody else to call his dog. (laughs) Got to tell the truth consistently. Paul put it this way, Ephesians 4. He said, let our lives lovingly express the truth in all things. Look at this. Speaking truly, dealing truly, and living truly. That is telling the truth consistently. Honesty is a lifestyle. And I've got to be consistent. Proverbs 11 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. I love that word. Paul calls it a double-mindedness. You know, one's true, one's not, and nobody's going to trust somebody who's double-minded. Dishonesty will destroy you. Abraham Lincoln said, No man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. 
Mark Twain said, if you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> you think about that. Well, no, this is exactly the way it happened. This is exactly what was said. Everything we do is built on trust. Now, we've gotten to a place in our culture and our society where, you know, that trust is deteriorating in a lot of areas and a lot of facets of our culture. Why is that? Because we've learned not to trust people because they don't tell us the truth. See, that's why truth-telling, especially for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, is so important. Tell it completely. Tell it consistently. Tell the truth lovingly. Lovingly. Ephesians 4.15 from NIV. Instead, Paul says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Let me tell you something. Just because something is true doesn't mean you have to beat people up with it. Well, it's true. It's true. I'm only telling you this because it's true. See, people always perceive truth without love as an attack. It doesn't make any difference if it's true or not. They'll resist that truth if it's not delivered wrapped in love. That's why it's important to earn the right to speak the truth. You see, Somebody may come up to you and they've got something they want to tell you and they say, I love you, so I'm going to tell you this. Now, the problem with that is, is just because you say you love somebody doesn't necessarily mean you love somebody. Speaking the truth in love, you earn the right to do that. And just because you speak it and say, I love you, so I'm going to tell you the truth, if you don't have the right relationship with that person, you're going to make an enemy. But, but it tells me, speak the truth. And I told him I loved him. Well, yeah, you know, uh, that's not some kind of good luck charm. I love you, but I'm going to tell you this. You earn the right to share truth. It begins with a relationship in order to share truth in love. Not just because you say you love somebody do you have the right to share truth with them. Because here's the thing. Most of the time when somebody says, I love you, but... I'm, I'm going to tell you this, and it's true. See, you'll know you're telling somebody the truth in love when what you're telling them has nothing to do with you. See, it's not about your preferences. It's not about your taste. It's not about your opinion. It's not about your comfort zone. It has nothing to do with you when you speak the truth in love. It has nothing to do with what you personally prefer or don't prefer. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do when you've earned the right and have the relationship to speak the truth in love in order to make a better life for the person you're speaking to in love. That's what it's about. It's not about you to get something off your chest because you don't like the way they comb their hair or keep their house or whatever it is. <laughs> the way they sing at church. <laughs> what they believe about church. It, it, it has, it's not about you when it comes to sharing the truth and love. It's about an effort to make the life of the person you're sharing the truth with better. Paul says, Ephesians 4.29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful. Why? For building up others. How? According to their needs. And what's the reason? For that it may benefit those who listen. You, you see that? When we talk about speaking the truth in love, it's according to their needs, not yours. It's for their benefit, not yours. Speak the truth lovingly. And then finally, speak uh, the truth tactfully. Tactfully. Again, Proverbs Solomon says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. Every time you speak, and this isn't just about, this is all about false testimony. It's not just about lying, and when you know you lie, it's the broad spectrum of saying, okay, when I want to speak, I want to speak tactfully. You may speak lovingly, but it's also got to be tactful. You have an option every time you speak. The words you use can either heal or hurt. 
The words you use can either develop people or destroy people. The words you use can either build them up or tear them down. They can either delight or devastate. The words we use have tremendous power and should always be weighed and chosen very carefully. Because here's the deal. When you speak the truth in love and with tact, you will learn how to make a point without making an enemy. Proverbs again, Proverbs 16, intelligent people think before they speak. <laughs> you know, anytime you say, I didn't think before I spoke, you're saying, I'm just stupid. <laughs> That's what that admission is, you know. Because I, I, the Bible says intelligent people think. Well, I didn't think. Well, there you go. Here's your sign. <laughs> I've always wanted to use that line sometime, and there it was, a perfect opportunity. Uh, I'm just stupid because I didn't think before I spoke. I put this little acrostic in, uh, I think it's in your program. Uh, is it in there? T-H-I-N-K? Okay. Because uh, this, is, this is a great test. You know, if you want to think before you speak, start off, is it true? T. Is it true? If it's not true and you don't, can't verify it to be true, we got no business sharing it. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it? Some things, some things may be true, but they may not be helpful. <laughs> you know, so is it helpful? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is about what you're what you, is uh, what you're about to share? Is it is it encouraging or discouraging? T H I N. Is it necessary? <laughs> A lot of things we say uh, just aren't necessary. Now, here's the thing. They may not necessarily be wrong. <laughs> they just may not be necessary for you to say it. T-H-I-N, necessary. K, is it kind? T think before you speak. I, I got this years ago, and I thought, this is a good, good spot for that. T-H-I-N-K. It's very important that we handle the truth properly. It's very important to know how we lie, why we lie, and how to tell the truth. We, we've been given the responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ to speak truth. To speak the truth consistently and completely and kindly. With love and tactfully. That's also true when it comes to this truth. The truth of the word of God. See I stand up here week after week after week after week. And I know, I see all kinds of people who, who enjoy a variety of relationships with this truth. Some of you, many of you, maybe even most of you, have heard the truth of God's Word and you've responded to the truth of God's Word. Some of you have heard the truth of God's Word and have yet to respond to the truth of God's Word. And some of you maybe have never heard the truth at all. So I want to take just a few moments to share with you the truth of this book uh, consistently, completely, lovingly, and tactfully. And here it is. The first truth, the first great truth that comes from the truth of this Word is that we are all moral failures. And we've been nine weeks into this series and, you know, more than likely at some point at any given time in our life, we kind of can check all nine of them off. Maybe not all nine. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But we can check a lot of them off, okay? Because here's the truth. The truth that this book says we are all moral failures. The Bible is very clear. For all have sinned. That's you, that's me, that's all of us for all time. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it is a truth we have come to grips with personally. Because here's the thing. Right now, for some of you, Satan may be whispering in your ear and in your heart. Yeah, you can't believe this. It's not true. That's what, that's what, that's what Satan said to Adam and Eve. Did God really? See, there it is. Did God really say he was giving false testimony by questioning God? Did God really say that? Yeah, that's not true. And he's doing the same maybe to some of you today. You, come on. You're fine. I'm okay. You're okay. Don't believe that stuff about sin. See, he may say, you're fine. But the truth of this book says, no matter how good we think we are, no matter how good we may appear to in comparison to other people around us, 
we all fall dismally short of God's perfect moral standard. That's the truth. The second great truth is that someday we're going to stand in the blazing brilliance of God's holiness. We're going to stand before the God of the universe. Then all of our shams, all of our cover-ups, all of our put-offs will be seen for what they really are. Well, we may be really able to hide the truth from ourselves and from others right now. About ourselves from others right now. But there's coming a day when the condition of your soul, my soul, our souls will be painfully evident as we stand before the God of the universe. The third great truth. I don't even like to talk about this one, but it is true because the book says it's true. The third great truth is that people who have not repented are doomed and cursed to an eternity in hell. I I tell you, I wish I didn't have to talk about that. But I'm committed to telling you the truth today completely, consistently, lovingly, and tactfully. And the Bible says that's true. That unrepentant sinners will be separated from the eternal God of the universe forever and they'll dwell in a place where evil in all of its horror will be fully unleashed for eternity. So we've sinned. We'll stand before God someday. And if we haven't made that choice that the Bible talks about, the truth speaks, then we can end up in hell. But here's the fourth great truth. Is that those who acknowledge their sinfulness. Those who ask Jesus to become their savior and leader in life. Will escape the judgment of hell. And enter into the kingdom of God who will tell you as you cross in. Well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my kingdom. Let me ask you, where are you in your understanding of those four great truths? Have you really been honest about your sin? See, you can't lie that one. Are you willing today to give your life to Jesus Christ? Because his promise, and this is the truth, he will forgive you, he will save you, and he is preparing a home for you with him in all of eternity. (laughs) And that today is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You say, how do I find that cure? Well, you see, what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary makes it real. The fact that he understood that we've all sinned. And the fact that he willingly went to the cross to pay the penalty. Somebody had to die for your sin and my sin. For the sins for all people for all time. The Bible says, Peter says, once and for all Jesus died to bring us to God. And I don't know how anybody can consider the cross. And not come to the conclusion that God loves you and wants to spend eternity with you. Now, wherever you are in those great truths, maybe, maybe, I said that, there's a, every week I see people in different stages of truth. Those who have heard the truth, responded to the truth, and are followers of Jesus Christ. Those who've heard the truth and have been ignoring it, or maybe those who've never heard the truth. Well, there's the truth. God loves you so much that he gave his only son. So that you don't have to suffer the consequences, the eternal consequences of hell. But you can enjoy eternally fellowship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to sing this song because it's all about the cross. The cross is what made that salvation possible. And if you're ready to make that decision and that choice today, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Maybe, to, first of all, first time ever to commit your life to Jesus Christ. I believe that truth, Bruce, and I commit my life to Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe you've believed it and haven't sealed the deal by being baptized as the Bible teaches. Maybe you're just looking for a community of faith to join and be a part of. We journey this path together. 
whatever is on your heart. We're going to sing this song. And if you're ready to make that choice and that decision, I'm going to invite you to step out and make your way to the front. Jason, let's sing. Let's sing together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Be seated, please. Jesus made it very clear, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is the truth. And the cross is what makes it all possible. So as we gather today to remember his love for us, to remember what he has accomplished for us on the cross, cleansing us of all unrighteousness and his resurrection guaranteeing our life eternal life as we come together today let's eat the wafer together being reminded of the body of Christ and as we remember the blood let's drink the cup together Lord God, we are thankful. We're thankful for that you are the truth, the life, and the way. Father, forgive us where we have failed in this commandment. Whether it's out, out lies or any of the other ways we lie, Father, we repent and forgive us. We claim your forgiveness through the blood of Christ. Father, it doesn't do us any good unless we commit as well to live our lives for your glory. And we're reminded of your sacrifice. We renew ourselves before you today. Rededicate and recommit ourselves to living truthfully for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us today online, uh, our Unity Christian Church services. Each week, we premiere at 8 o'clock every Sunday, and we're th we thank you for being a part of that. For more information about our church, you can go to unitychristianchurch.net, to our website, and uh, find a connection to our services, as well as that additional information about how you can give and how you can connect with us further. God bless you. Have a great week, and be safe.